every single person is going to be like, I, I know what it is. That's the topic for next week. I got it. And they're just going to start spamming in there. Which is fine, because today we have a treat, Steve. We're not only are we dipping into a new universe, so we get to talk about something new. We also get to talk about my favorite ship from the setting. Battlestar Galactica wins for the best designs of all time, but man, does Stargate come really, really close? Especially the human ships and what we're going to be talking about. Why did you have to ping that? That's going to be on the recording. You're now, welcome. Oh boy. Uh, we're recording back to back in case that uh, <laughs> won't obvious, so. Yeah, I know. But it is what it is. It's fine. So let me throw you in a picture so you can see what we're talking about today, because it is an absolute beauty of a ship. And it looks like a brick shithouse that's been designed to kick ass, which is very rare in sci-fi. Most of the time they have very flowery, very elegant looking designs. No, not this thing. It's a brick of guns and missiles, and it does exactly what you think it would. Uh, Q brick house by whoever sings it. Like the Commodores supposed to be the funny man come on be funny i i well i would i just spent the past two two minutes since you posted that trying to look up who sings brick house and lyrics to it so i can just oh, okay. in the episode all right your brain power is a little bit underutilized yeah, exactly. right now exactly. or you're you're a little underpowered yeah you're, you're using most of that capacity so that's that's fair enough so for today we're going to be covering the creation the history and development of the bc 304 daedalus class as well as all the technical aspects of the ship like its armaments dimensions and special quirks since there's quite a few of them and then we're going to talk a little bit about the funny shit that this ship has done because there's something special about this series that we'll get into later. For now, though, generic greetings and welcome to Science and Sanity, a channel dedicated to bringing my love of sci-fi and all its incredible style to you, the viewer. Along for the ride is my friend, co-host, and science illiterate Steve. Say hello, content slave. Hello. Perfect. I love that you always put your mouth right on the microphone whenever you do that. I gotta do it. it it's a mon monotone voice, no emotion whatsoever. You gotta and gotta be right on it. Gotta be loud, gotta be assertive, gotta swallow the microphone. Only time and... I will properly use the mic in any episode ever. <laughs> Every other time you're like dipping in and out or <laughs> screaming wildly. If you enjoy the video, however, or me and Steve's wonderful banter, subscribe, ring the bell, you know, like, comment, all that stuff, since it really does help a small channel like this fight the YouTube algorithm. Or if you're feeling particularly generous, check out the Patreon and buy Sia coffee or feed Steve. If you'd rather just hang out with fellow Turbo Nerds, we do have a Discord, everything linked in the video description. And with that out of the way, let's get into things. So, Steve, what do you know about the Stargate series? Uh, it's a gate that's in the stars, uh, and it, I'm gonna say it teleports people around. You are immediately wrong on, like, half of what you just said. It is a Stargate, you can transport people through it, but it's not in space, it's on the ground. Often they're buried under mountains and stuff, but that's that's besides the point. The name is a little bit misleading. Do you want, uh, like, a quick five-minute summary before we get into things? Well, up to you. I mean, I I'll just go in and wall dog this. I, I don't care. Okay, well, that wasn't optional. I'm giving you at least a little bit of background okay. because it's both funny and you're kind of going to need it. The only important stuff you need context for is the earlier parts of the setting. Uh, factions like the Ori, the Asgard, Replicators, Wraith, more like all that stuff comes significantly later and is not super important. You just need to know the basic early context for what we're setting up later on. Turns out Ancient Aliens was right along with all the Xeno filth and stuff that they peddle, and aliens have been kicking around for a very, very long time on and around Earth. The way that they traveled to and from the Earth was, again, with the stunningly named Stargate, a giant spinning ring that creates a portal from one gate to any other gate in the Milky Way galaxy and sometimes beyond. Stargate Command is a US-based military organization meant to explore beyond the ring, adventuring across countless worlds and alien landscapes, and for some reason, pretty much every world either looks like the Midwestern U.S. deserts or Canada, but, you know, that's fine. There's explanations for that. Early. That's No, that's actually true, by the way, because okay. it's like budget budget issues. They only had like three set locations that they filmed at. One was in like um, up in Canada. The other was down in like the United States, the Midwest and the deserts that you guys have. And one was in a faux military base. And that, that's literally it. Those are like the three settings that they have. So every everything takes place there. I eat and... Fun fact, actually, the Cheney, Cheney, whatever the fuck you pronounce it, military complex, the famous one in the States, the real place, uh, they actually filmed a few shots there and they were let inside for reference to the sets that they were going to build. And there's actually a door in the real military complex that's locked and labeled Stargate Command and nobody's allowed past it. It's probably like a janitor's closet, but it's like a funny little real tie into the actual series. That, that's pretty good. 
that that is pretty good. Stargate Command goes through one of these transports, one of these portals, and one of their teams, SG-1, runs into the Goa'uld, a race of parasitic slugs that burrow into your brainstem or nervous system or whatever, something like that, and they use the human body like a meat puppet, completely subsuming the person that was there. They're also the explanation for why humans show up literally everywhere in the galaxy. It's like nine times out of ten when they go through a gate, they end up on a planet that's got like tribal humans or like Bronze Age humans just kicking around doing nothing on this world. And normally in sci-fi, it's kind of like, how did these people get all over the galaxy? And the reason for that is because the Goa... I'm going to interrupt myself again. No, I'm not calling them that because it's just... Dude, you, you try saying it. That word is just... It sucks. It's so bad. I hate saying it. What do you spell it? Goa? It's like G-O-U apostrophe A-U-L-D or something like All that. Right, we're, we're getting too complicated. Now, I don't say anything that has apostrophes in it. So we're just going to call them the Gould. It's like ghoul, but with a D. Much easier to say. Very simple. Well, we call them ghouls. Yeah, okay. Let's call them ghouls. Why not? Anyways, the ghouls stumble across Earth, realize, damn, these humans make amazing slaves, as you do, and immediately set about molding the culture and kidnapping many, many people to use on other worlds as more free slave labor. They're also the Egyptian gods. Like, actually. Uh, okay. Ra, Anubis, Sobek, like, that. Those are, those are their names. That's like their shtick. They like to pretend that they're divine entities. So this is, this is the ghouls' actual ship. Notice the giant pyramid in the center? Yes. Uh, turns out everywhere that these guys go, they get people to build pyramids because they're like the core of their spaceships. And we see a couple times that they like land on a planet, pick it up and fly away. Ancient Aliens was correct. The pyramids were, in fact, built by sort of and for aliens. And they're full of a bunch of ancient technology and shit. Uh, but does this does this spark nothing in you? Does this not make you angry about how stupid this is? No. I, I've, I've adapted to... Um... I simply not really, really caring how stupid stuff is anymore because um, everything's just... Steve, yes. this is the timeline where Ancient Aliens was actually correct about everything. Are you are you saying that's not the current timeline? No, it's not the current... Oh my god, okay. You know what? It's fine. Can I get proof? The, the proof is that I made it the fuck up, Steve. That's what I thought. <laughs> oh my god. God. So the ghoul to keep humanity under the thumb for a few centuries, preventing advancement, all that, because they don't really want their slaves to rise up and get advanced enough to challenge them. And they left Earth after a particularly bad rebellion. Noped out of here because it was more effort than it was worth. And they forgot Earth existed. They, they forgot. And this is part of the reason that mankind got to develop into anything past the Iron Age. The ghoul's official government or organization is called the System Lords. That's the name. Essentially, a crap ton of petty little shit nothing nobles all running their own toll booth worlds and pretending to be important. Oh, shit, they all think they're fucking New Jersey. Dude, it's like the Holy Roman Empire on steroids, man. Just, it's so much worse, though. There's a lot of conflict here. They backstab each other all the time. And it's super common to just lose information about entire worlds existing, or new technologies, or super weapons. Like, when a Gould system lord creates a super weapon or a new ship or something, they don't share that shit. They don't give it to anybody. They're just going to use it for themselves and try to kill all of their rivals and get more power. So, if you end up killing that guy, or he makes a mistake or whatever and gets nuked, then... Well, sucks for their entire race, I guess. They lost out on whatever that guy developed. <laughs> sucks to suck. Simply be better. Yeah, pretty much. There's like no coherency between them whatsoever. So Stargate Command essentially gets to romp around the galaxy, finding neat inventions and cool technologies and slowly stockpiling them away like the hoarding of rats that people are, because the bad guys for most of the series are massively ineffective and incompetent just by societal design. By the way, when I say that uh, like humanity in Stargate hoards things like a dragon and its pile of gold, I do mean that. The amount of shit that Stargate Command gets their hands on, like, it just, it, it's mind-numbing. Are we talking about, like, uh, creating our, another museum t type of mind-numbing here, or...? No, 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 not, not quite like that. Not, not, not that quite many, like okay. that. It's, it's more like, hey, this is alien stuff, there's no one around here to guard it, let's just take it. Or sometimes, hey, this is alien stuff, there's a lot of people around here guarding it, let's just take it. But, I understandable. And this is going to bleed into the history of the ship we're talking about because it's done in a really cool way. One episode, they discover a special element or substance called Naquita, 
and it can be used to make incredibly powerful energy sources and even uber-enhance atomic weapons. It essentially turning a nuke spicy, for lack of a better term, like just... I ate spicy nukes? <laughs> It's the fucking Chipotle mayo of nuclear bombs. Oh. Anyway, <laughs> now, they discover it. They give it to the scientist man back at base, and he goes, Hey, we'll get to work on not killing ourselves with this. Don't worry. Then, a season later or something, they go, Hey, remember that thing you found that adds ghost pepper energy to our nukes? We made a thing with it to power your latest plan. Or to blow up a moon. Have fun. Uh, uh, okay. So over the course of the series, humanity very slowly loot goblins their way into all the technology and advancements needed to start building, like, real actual spaceships. And you get to watch the actual progression of mankind as they go from stuck on this absolute shithole we call a planet to kicking ass across the stars. And it's immensely satisfying as you watch it happen. The pinnacle in the setting so far is the topic of the day, the BC-304, also known as the Daedalus class. So the true development of the Daedalus starts really early on in the series. Like I mentioned, Stargate Command and the various SG teams, for the most part, only started off worrying about fighting the ghouls when they find them on whatever planet they're on, smaller rebellions and skirmishes and battles, and they win, and there's all this wonderful hurrah stuff, and very occasionally when the ghouls are in like overwhelming numbers or they're hovering over the Stargate with their one of their battleships, SG-1 is like, I we out, and they just leave, they run away, and that's pretty much what the early episodes are. But everything really comes to a head when the ghouls are like, wait a minute, I remember this planet, this is where we got all our slaves from all that time ago, and they launched an attack on Earth. The only real chance that they have, because these ships have shields, they put them up and the nukes do absolutely dick, are a group of Jaffa slaves, which are humans that have been slightly modified to be the foot soldiers and grunts that Stargate Command has been fighting. They're, they're a slave caste, but they're soldiers, not workers. So with the help of some of these free Jaffa and Stargate 1 that stowed away aboard these ships, they successfully destroyed them by blowing up the reactors, lowering the nukes, getting them ready to be destroyed, basically. And as it turns out, without the shields, these ships cannot, in fact, parry nukes. The Cult of the Bomb approves. Yes. This experience was really the start of the BC-304's development, since it became abundantly clear that Earth had no way to protect itself against the threat of the ghoul system lords. This spurred the development of the next step towards perfection, the X-301, and I have a picture of it that I shall give you. Now this thing looks a little silly, and there's an explanation for that. A lot of the, the ghoul's tech is like very Egyptian inspired. A Romulan warbird, I can't believe this. It's not a Romulan warbird. We're not it's talking not about even really close, no. but not even really <laughs> close. But it's it's got the wings, so close enough. So therefore, I will classify it as one. <laughs> every every Trek fan watching just cried out in rage. How could you do this, Steve? This was part of that reverse engineered loot goblin tech thing I told you about. Essentially, when they blew up those ships, there was a bunch of stuff that they could salvage because the space shuttle went up there to save the cast and carry a whole bunch of that shit back down with it and combining it with what them th they themselves had learned, they made a single stealth fighter that carried two of those special spicy nukes, and was intended to destroy any more ghoul ships that came to Earth by sneaking in real close and ramming a missile right up their ass before they, well, took notice and raised their shields. This thing worked, but they only had one, and just like everyone knows, one of anything is none of anything in a war. So with the knowledge of how to make this stuff now, sort of, Earth began producing the F-302, and this is all domestic production for one of the coolest looking fighter craft in science fiction. This thing is genuinely amazing, by the way. I'll throw you a couple more pictures. Bro, the, the thing looks like it uh, didn't make it off the drawing board with <laughs> all those ankles on it still. <laughs> Here's the thing, right? You, you think that it's like, oh, it's super blocky, it looks like a weird flying wing, it could never work, but it's got a whole bunch of weird alien tech in it, and they mass-produced it. It's just, it looks dope as fuck as well, so rule of cool means that it just works. It's got those air-sucking engines underneath, because it's a hybrid fighter. While in atmosphere, it can fly like a normal jet, though with bullshit maneuverability, since it can use its magic inertialess alien engines and shields and stuff. And in space, it can cut off the air-sucking engines and switch to a rocket system of propulsion to work in a vacuum. Uh, the prototype had the ability to jump from one star system to another, so it could start in the solar system and orbit around Earth, and then jump over to Alpha Centauri or something, and jump back. 
The later versions of it, though, they didn't have the technology and the resources to keep making those, so they were like, okay, it's not feasible, but what we are going to do is give them short jump drives, meaning they can jump from orbit around Earth to orbit around Mars, that kind of thing, like skip in system rather than jumping from one system to, to a different system. So the 302 was fantastic, and it let mankind hold a reasonably large arsenal of surface-to-space fighters capable of destroying capital ships and enemy ghoul small craft like fighters and transports. But the issue was they had no real way to operate outside the solar system, essentially halting any long-range operations and allowing the ghouls to always have the upper hand in any engagement because they get to prepare off on their other planets doing whatever. By this point, they had a shitload of tech that they had stolen because they're blowing ghoul ships up left and right, they're stealing stuff all over the place. So they begin constructing the Prometheus, the fugliest looking, dumbest design to ever curse sci-fi fans everywhere. This thing is disgusting, and I hate it. Here's some oh, pictures of it for you. It would be a workhouse, but um, all right, the second picture makes it not not look so good. It's a it's a basically a probo pass. It looks like uh, the snout. To be perfectly honest, it kind of looks like someone asked an AI to draw a robot dick. That's the only thing right, I can ever on. see it as. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Don't you dare. Don't. Uh, no. <laughs> the answer the answer isn't stop. It's happening. It's happening. No. It's happening. No. No. Okay, anyways, while you're on that, I'm going to I'm just going to continue on. There's a few huge issues with the Prometheus. It's terribly designed. The hangars on each side were too small to be effective, allowing only one of the 302s to launch at a time in single slow file. Uh, the main conning tower was poorly protected. The ship overall just looked like a piece of shit and it kind of didn't work right. The first few times they took it out was nothing but teething issues, and it barely functioned with a lot of the tech they were trying to put in it, but it had shields, it had weapons, it had missiles, so hey presto, off they go. By the end of its roughly three year long service life in the show's universe, it was destroyed in combat, but the Prometheus had pioneered and refined a huge number of technologies and laid the groundwork for its successor, the X-304 testbed, later officially christened the BC-304. The first ship of the class was named the Daedalus. Originally, the 304 was supposed to be a development on the Prometheus, and the Daedalus was actually the sister ship. And uh, thank God it wasn't the sister ship. Very, very photogenic as well. It looks damn good on screen and in pictures. 12 out of 10 design. Well, I'm only going to give it an 11.8. Wow, rude. The Daedalus was a massive step up technologically. While the Prometheus used salvage components and tech from the Gould, the Daedalus was designed from the ground up with the assistance of the Asgard, another uber-advanced alien race, to include a lot of this stuff by default and by design. So its systems worked together far, far better than the Prometheus did. Its shields were monstrously effective, possessing a hyperdrive that made it faster and more accurate than any other contemporary foe, and later being equipped with the mean beams of God that you see in that image at the very bottom, once the ship gets these things, if they're working properly, it basically can't lose a fight. It also has a variable fuel reactor, able to use Naquita like the old Gould tech to power itself, though it guzzled fuel like nobody's business, or, if available, could slot in a zero-point module to give it essentially unlimited power and an uber boost to its performance. Overall, like, this thing was a beast. It was a monstrously powerful warship. The 304 fundamentally changed the balance of power in the Milky Way. By the time that Earth had started producing them in decent numbers, I think there's like seven or eight of them or something like that, like the most that they ever had before any of them started getting destroyed. When they had a small fleet of these things, they were essentially a, a superpower player in the Milky Way. They could enforce whatever they wanted on almost anyone they wanted, because they could rock up with two or three of these ships and completely wipe the floor with an entire fleet of Gould Hatak cruisers. We have, we have breaking news. We finally have the AI generated image. Oh God, it's please going don't. In, it's going in picture printer. There's no fucking way that's what it spat back out at you. That, that is. The machine doesn't understand. It's okay. We're Don't safe. Worry, we'll refine our search. No, please. Okay. Stop. <laughs> That's close enough. It's okay. Any, anyways, moving on, moving on, moving on, moving on. Stop. The Daedalus also pioneered into another galaxy. Following the Atlantis expedition that traveled through a stargate to a different galaxy, they found the Wraith, a parasitic swarm of locust-style aliens that emerge every few hundred years to feed on, like, every sentient being they can. 
The Daedalus used its lasers, sure, but it also had Asgard teleporters by this point. Which they meant had what kind of teleporters? <laughs> Asgard teleporters. Oh my god, okay. It's not the Bifrost, be quiet. No, I shall not. Anyways, these teleporters meant that it could use my all-time favorite tactic in sci-fi, which I will forever look at Star Trek and call them stupid for not doing this, is whenever a ship was unshielded or surprised or just... They, they did this all the time, really, even just beaming them directly outside the ship if they couldn't get it inside. They took those spicy nukes and just teleported them directly into the enemy ship to detonate milliseconds after they actually teleported them. So there's multiple examples where the Daedalus just rocks up, yeets a nuke at you, and watches as the enemy ship turns into a sun for half a second, then just uh, leaves because it can. Uh, okay. Real? It's, it's remarkably violent. Like, it, Stargate is special in science fiction because it really does use its technology how you would expect. They give them teleporters, and a human soldier, or just a human in general, is like, how could I use this as a weapon? Ah, beam a really big explosive directly on top of the enemy's forehead. And you know that's exactly how everybody would use it. And if yep. you say that they wouldn't, no, shut up. Humanity will always be humanity. If you give someone a teleporter, they're going to try to teleport bombs with it. It's just how it works. That concludes the history and a brief summary of Stargate as a series. Now, we have a few things that come next. We got the weapons, the technical dimensions of the ship, and some quirks and abilities. Where, where do you want to start? Let's start with the uh, technical uh, capabilities of the said ship. The boring small part that we can get out of the yes. way quickly. Boring and fast yes. one. The Daedalus isn't actually that big. In the grand scheme of things, it's actually really small. Coming in at a reasonable 75 meters tall, 95 meters wide, and 225 meters long, the 304 is only like marginally smaller than most aircraft carriers. Modern day super carriers eclipse this thing in size. Like the Gerald Ford, right? The, the really big, pointlessly large Uber carriers that America builds so that you guys can fight God and win. You know those? Yeah, yes, I, I in fact do know those, yes. Yeah, your, your tax dollars pay for those. They are significantly bigger than the Daedalus is. They're like 340 meters long, 75 meters tall, uh, 80 meters wide, something like that. About the same dimensions, but about 50% longer than the spaceship is, which makes it hilarious, in my opinion, because the Daedalus is really compact for what it can do. It's like your stereotypical 5'11 manlet. Under six foot, society is deemed you worthless, and you have to compensate for their small stature with extreme and rapid violence, like a coked out honey badger. Uh, okay. What, am I wrong? Nope. Exactly. I'm, I'm correct. I'm always correct. I am completely flawless. There's a few things that aren't really listed in the dimensions. The hangar bays, for one, don't have an officially listed size, at least not one that I could find. But based on the dimensions we have, and just by looking at, like, a front ortho view of the thing, you can measure it out that each of them is about 20 to 25 meters wide and about 90 to 100 meters long from back to front. So they're reasonably sized. And that's realistically it. The only other thing is that it carries uh, 16 fighters that fit eight into each of those flight pods, and that's pretty much it. So, special quirks and abilities or guns, what do we do next? Um, let's go to guns. Ah, you have chosen wisely. This ship fucking slaps. Like, I don't think you understand how hard this thing kicks the shit out of everyone else. Transport the original Daedalus into any hard sci-fi, like, before it gets the lasers, or medium sci-fi universe, like The Expanse, Battlestar Galactica, Halo, it fucking slaps. It will go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the best that all of these other sci-fi universes have. At least, like, not the uber shit, like the Forerunners, I'm talking, like, current timeline, like, current era in Halo, the okay. Humanity Covenant, all that stuff, right? The, the refit version, with better power generation, shields, and beam weapons, Teleport it into Star Wars or Star Trek, whatever, any of these fantasy settings, it will style on everything. So let's let's start with the conventional weapons that it has. The Daedalus is armed with the very best slug throwers mankind has to offer, situated all around the ship, giving it full coverage from small craft and we weaker capital ships, are 32 rapid fire and reload railguns. It, it's spooky as fuck, right? It's nowhere near as powerful as the railguns from the Expanse, those being relativistic hole punchers, but that's, that's because they're small. Like, roughly the size of a main battle tank's gun in girth and mass, powered by, like, a small knockwood generator, since you can just plop them down anywhere like any old gun turret and they just work. 
although commonly they're powered by the parent uh, systems of the starbase or military facility that they're a part of. The railgun turret fires slugs up to almost Mach 6. The wiki says Mach 5, but I stumbled across a Reddit thread where some, some guy was doing uber nerd math and they calculated it out to be like roughly 5.8, 5.9 Mach, something like that. But I'm just going to round it up to 6 because it's funnier. It fires projectiles at a mind-numbing 7,400 kilometers per hour, or 2.1 kilometers per second. But they also have a special feature. Because of how much power they can handle, the railguns have a rapid recharge and fire rate meaning that they shoot in bursts before needing to recharge. Oh my god, it's an autoloader. Yeah, pretty much. You can even see there in the image I posted where the Daedalus is just letting rip on a Wraith Hive ship. Um, they fire bursts of 5 to 10 projectiles in like half a second before taking a while to recharge. If, however, you just want a constant fire rate, they can hold a sustained bullet hose of 500 rounds a minute. It's like 8.5 rounds per second, which is absolutely monstrous for a weapon this powerful, by the way. The real punching power of the 304 comes from the missiles and lasers. This thing carries 16 VLS silos. You see the long neck that extends out from the center there? That's basically just a, a giant bucket of missiles that they fire at everything. These are similarly oh, okay. rapid reloading and firing, right? They can dump dozens of missiles into the void in seconds. There's actually a really sick scene from Stargate Atlantis. Uh, I'm, I can't be bothered to go find it, and it's probably going to be copyright struck out of the video, but essentially... This thing jumps out of uh, FTL, right behind an enemy hive ship, and then just because it can, it shits out like three dozen missiles, all of them nuclear, because of course they are, oh, obliterates shit. the enemy ship, completely evaporating it, and then just jumps away, because it can. When it comes to the actual missiles and stuff that it's got, it's got three types of danger pylons. It's got, oh no wait, hang on, I, technically four, if we count the civilization buster, but we'll get to that. Oh god. St starting with the bog standard. It has pretty much infinite amount of normal cruise missiles, fast, maneuverable, medium yield. They're a mix of anti-fighter and anti-capital ship. You've seen these literally everywhere. If you've ever seen a missile in sci-fi, this is what they are. They don't do a lot of damage to big warships, but if you hit them with a bunch of them, they can do enough to knock out critical systems like engines, hangars, and more. The bigger ones are, well, the sun. Legalized nuclear bombs. Oh, dude, the Daedalus has legalized them a long time ago, and they're coming to deliver them to everyone who's willing to take them, man. Look, I, I was gonna play the soundboard, but you get mad when I play the soundboard. So. You're right, I do. Thank you for holding off. A standard fusion bomb is big enough that against unshielded opponents, it will, at a minimum, cripple a ship, if not outright destroy smaller ones. However, because of screw you power scaling reasons, they don't do shit against shields or sufficiently heavily armored and girthy ships like a Wraith Hive. You need multiple of them to get a kill in that kind of situation. Then, a step up, they have the Mark IX's, a Nequadria enhanced nuke. The Chipotle nuke is coming back for revenge, and not even your super shielded bathroom will save you from this blowout. No. Space Taco Bell's come a call and you ain't got no answer. <laughs> oh, hate it when that happens, man. <laughs> they are, however, monstrously powerful. Able to blow up stargates completely, remove entire continents from the surface of a planet if they got a big enough yield, and cast Power Word Kill on pretty much anything it hits that isn't shielded. Even against shielded targets, it's common for this warhead to cripple the ship by overloading or melting the power systems as they try to resist the explosion. And that's pretty much the end of all the conventional fuck you that the 304 carries. Let's go on to the unconventional fuck you. And uh, this would be stuff like the Civilization Buster, the express ticket to extinction. The landlord has evicted you from life. The Horizon Missile. This this is a MERV. Do you know what a MERV is? Uh, no. A multiple re-entry vehicle, right? It's okay. It's big, big missile that's got a lot of smaller nukes inside of it, that kind of thing. The Horizon has six Mark IX gate busters and four decoy warheads to draw fire and attention when launched. The six Mark IX's target a wide range across the entire hemisphere of a planet, chaining their detonations to all but annihilate an entire hemisphere of the world. It, the easiest way to think about it is it's essentially every natural disaster at the same time on steroids happening just after the blast itself obliterated entire countries off a planet's surface. Well, well, okay then. The actual scene where it was fired as well, I think held a record in television for a while at least the longest continuous CGI scene ever put to screen, at just over a minute and a half start to finish, at least for television. You get to watch it be prepped, deployed, 
fired, follow it all the way down to the planet and see the explosions across the surface. It's actually very, very cool. And finally, we move on to the meme beams. These were added later as a refit, so I guess technically you could call this version the B the 304-2 since it is technically a different ship. While the missiles can be pretty effectively blocked by shields and the railguns were never particularly powerful anti-ship weapons, these things they will cut through a Gould ship like it's one of those thousand degree knife versus pre-melted butter videos, okay? Like, it, the ship isn't even oh, there. Okay. They, fire, they fire it, and the pyramid ship is gone. Simply, Thanos snapped out of reality. There's a later threat called the Ori, which are expressly shown to have shields so strong that pretty much nothing will hurt them. And they get these beam weapons, and with three shots, the Ori ship just explodes. And you're oh. like, well, oh, okay. okay, yep. And then that when happens. Stargate, yeah, they have Stargate Atlantis, which is a much, much later series. They've got Hive ships, which are absolutely massive. Like, they're easily ten times the size of the Daedalus. Daedalus shoots them twice, they explode. You've got the Ancients, which are like the original gate builders or whatever. I'm not super caught up with the lore in that aspect. Their ships die with one or two shots from the beams. It's basically the Deus Ex Machina I win. As soon as the meme beams start, everyone else's hearts stop. That's basically what these things are. They're bonkers. And last, while well, kinda least, the Daedalus carries 16 F-302 fighters, those ones we talked about earlier. They're not super effective, it's basically just a small fighter complement that they can use for scouting, to create a perimeter, for checking out things that might be dangerous, like if there's a ship that's deactivated or whatever, and they don't want to get close to it, and you know, send one of these ships to go check it out first, that kind of thing. They do play an important role in some engagements across the series, but, I mean, not really. It's mostly just the Daedalus doing his thing, along with the other BC-304s that are generally around in the setting. One thing, though, that I okay. touched on earlier, one thing that is very unique, and I don't think a lot of people really understand, is how insanely violent Stargate Command actually is compared to the vast majority of other sci-fi. Not in terms of scale of violence, like 40k can bring 50,000 ships to bear on a single world, call it a crusade, and that's like barely a drop in the bucket. Violence in how fast they escalate, how quick they are willing to just immediately jump to the very top of the ladder and go for full extinction. Like, you go from zero all the way up to blowing up your sun. Which they did once. They dropped a Stargate into a star, and it went supernova. Huh? Okay. Weird flex, but all right. It's it's kind of insane. And the reason they do this is because humanity is unbelievably outnumbered. Like, it doesn't really matter that they have the most ridiculously overpowered ships in the setting anymore. Like, they can basically 1v10 anybody and win. But it doesn't matter when the enemy has, like, 50 times your number and they can be in 500 different places at once and you are permanently forced to keep a bunch of your ships at home to protect Earth. That's a bit of an issue for humanity. So in order to compensate for that, humanity jumps to extreme violence extremely quickly. If they identify a threat, they do not bring just enough force. They do not skirmish and fight and do the acrobatics and stuff for a little while and then talk it out like in Star Trek. No, no, no. They will immediately go for the kill shot. If your shields are down or you have no disruption, they will instantly beam a nuke aboard your ship with no question and just blow you up. If they get the chance, they will absolutely fire at you with the mean beams and just cut your ship in half, no questions asked. They go from peace and sunshine and talking to immediately thinking how they're going to exterminate an entire faction. So that's, that's a really cool aspect of it. I don't think a lot of people really are aware of or understand, but it's great when you really sit down to think about how remarkably violent Earth actually is. They're well on the path to becoming an interstellar empire. It's great. And that brings us to the last part, the arguably least important. It's just all the quirks and abilities that the ship have. Because this thing, this thing is a toy box, man. It's got a lot of stuff stapled onto it. So let me start with my favorite part. The fact that it's got two separate ways of teleporting things. We talked about the Asgard way before, but you know, that's the reasonable one, and that's the one they primarily use. But the people who built the Stargates also built smaller rings that work in groups of like four or six, whatever. They're about the size of a few people standing close together, and they're used for inter-system transport. They essentially dematerialize the target, transport them FTL to their destination, then rematerialize them can only be used in short distances, like ship to ship, ship to planet, planet to moon, that kind of thing. 
And the last thing that I really, really want to talk about, the Daedalus, is uh, speed. Because this is something that sci-fi fans love to argue about each other. Like, almost nothing will cause a nerd war faster than saying my faction or my setting has better FTL than your setting. Stargate may have probably one of the single best FTL systems or speeds or powers, whatever, in all of science fiction. Steve, I don't think you understand like how insane this is. Let me let me throw you some numbers and see if you get it. The okay. Daedalus can canonically travel from Earth in the Milky Way to the Pegasus Galaxy in about 20 days, which is a distance of 3 million light years. Do you have any idea how insane that speed is? Uh, um, let's see, 3 million divided by 20, um, several. Then you multiply that by the time, by the speed of light. The numbers might be getting a little bit too big for Steve's brain. Uh, there's a few zeros at the end of that there. Yes. I decided to not even bother converting it into like regular measurements because the numbers just get too fucking big and it would be an absolute pain in the ass to say. Instead, the Daedalus is fucking schmooving at six and a quarter thousand light years per hour. Six thousand two hundred and fifty light years per hour hour schmooving steve do you comprehend how fast that is can i go drunk drive that or booze cruising that distance there's a really good chance you'd probably overshoot or miss the entire galaxy but feel free to try I, it's just the pleasure of doing it it's the the issue i don't care about the destination it's about the journey right, you can't even see outside the ship when it's going ftl you would just point in a direction go turbo speed and then just what sit down and wait well, that must be outstanding when you're on acid or something. I can I can tell you that much. Well, looking out the window, it already looks like you're on acid, so it would probably be one hell of a trip. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And that is pretty much it. The history, the development, the technical aspects, the weapons, and a few special features from it. And that concludes the BC-304 Daedalus. Any ending remarks, Steve? Boy, fast. Those are my only remarks. Oh, hey, a new guy joined the Feed Steve tier. Look at that. Looks like you get a meal this Yo. month. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, another person joining that you're going to have to call out his name right as you're going to call out people's names. I caught it this time ahead of schedule. I uh, He didn't join like two minutes after we finished recording and then caused me to stroke out in rage. <laughs> things, are, things are fine. And speaking of, perfect segue into the patron thank you to all of the patrons supporting Science and Sanity in the background. Thank you all very much and to the members of the five dollar tier who are graciously feeding my co-host trapped in the basement a special thank you to david g the original augie 11 bravo crunchy terry higgins pedro munoz david g the other one silencer vox apollyon phoenix bt legends electro boy 11 logan maynard mickey david armon creed dome robin stop at fenrir striker tachi takane he's deb pixie virtus fabric 445 anchovy bob mini crustacean charles the snap paulie eric jones joseph holiday zombie the zerker david b sweet b Rastro, Le Butcher, Stabby Taco, Nomquam, Brian Hall, Jean Gabriel, did, no, I, I forgot, Gene, Joshua J. Lee, The Hayfork, Unit Zero, Tarly Bob, Kiwi Warrior, Julia Kaczynski, Douglas Germa, Jason Vigo, Screaming Stuka, Dudame, Dudime, whatever, whoever you are, and the new guy, Exothermic Reaction. You know what? I'm just going to call you Exothermic. Thank you very much Damn. to the members supporting Science and Thanity. I hope you will continue in the future. And that's pretty much it. Outros are hard. Goodbye.